about fluctuations and scaling in the Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, my, my talk is uh, not actual uh, present research in the, the strict sense, so it's not, uh, it's not borderline of what is uh, actually research on, on this uh, issue of uh, scaling in condensed matter physics. It's more like a view of how um, scaling variance appears in, in condensed matter systems. Was thought to I was my plan was to because this was a school try to be at an intermediate level between uh, uh, state of the art research and and PhD level. So I will I will talking about fluctuations and scaling and how scaling um, <coughs> takes place in in condensed matter systems in particular. And this the outline of my talk is, uh, I will discuss a little bit uh, uh, general questions about uh, scaling, power laws, and on the concept of universality. In a second part, I will talk about uh, what a generic scaling, a scaling variance is, and how it uh, takes place in equilibrium and non-equilibrium systems. And in particular, we will talk a little bit about one of the paradigms of um, scaling variance, which is the carrier precision equation. So the context of this talk is uh, any system, um, continuous system I will be talking about, but it's actually not important. The thing is that we have many degrees of freedom, and we have some system state variable, which is called phi here. Uh, it, could be a, it can be a particle density, magnetization, occupancy ratio, local displace, displacement, electric field, whatever our system, whatever, depending on, on the particular system we have. And this uh, variable um, depends on space on time. And since we have um, an extended system, we have many degrees of freedom. Um, a crucial quantity that we are very often um, interested in is the correlation function. The correlation function that um, is comp here is defined as the difference between, uh, at the same time, the difference between two uh, spatial positions in the system. And this typically measures how the information of one uh, from one place of the system is uh, affecting a distance uh, at, at a given point, at, this, uh, at a given distance x. So it's um, somehow measuring how correlated the system is. And this typically, in most uh, systems we handle every day, uh, is expected to decay um, in exponential form, which, um, such that uh, above a certain length scale, this uh, correction function uh, uh, becomes zero. This characteristic length and scale is the correlation length. Then we can do exactly a, an equivalent, equivalent description depending on the field we are working on. It's typical instead of measuring the correlation function or calculating the correlation function, it's, it's often more, more natural to compute the structure factor or the power spectrum of, of our uh, state variable and the equivalent this is equivalent to the spatial description in the sense that the Fourier transform of this correction function directly gives this uh, structure factor so both are um, uh, phase space and um, Fourier space and real space descriptions of, of the same quantity <coughs> in case the correction function is exponential the uh, Fourier transform this uh, structure factor is expected to be what well, is actually Lorentzian. And this case zero is uh, the characteristic um, um, wave number and it uh, is uh, proportional to the inverse of the correction length. So an exponential decay in the space of the correction function translates into um, a spectrum that has some k to the minus 2 scaling at uh, very short distances and then at large, dis uh, at large distances it uh, becomes uh, flat, which in Fourier space uh, means that uh, there are no correlations. 
the system is uncorrelated above some k0 um, wave number. There is uh, sometimes I find that some people um, uh, find uh, things wrongly about what correlation means, and then I prepare this transparency to show that the correlation is not necessarily order. So it's um, just um, statistical information. And here, just uh, to show an example of um, typical crystal where the correlation is finite, and then a move for solid, which is disorder, and still the correlation function is, uh, I mean, the correlation length is also uh, finite. So there's, there's no an equivalence between correlation and, and uh, order. It's, uh, the, it's much more subtle. Uh, another typical example of a correlation length is um, an example that I hope most of you know is the uh, Ising ferromagnet below TC, below the Fourier temperature, where we have um, this white phase, is the dominant phase in this case, and then we have uh, spots of uh, black, or the black phase, say the plus uh, spin, that is popping up in different parts of the system, and the correlation length is um, the typical size of this. Uh, of these clusters. So the correlation length is measuring um, how far a fluctuation can can extend in in, 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 a, in the C of the of the uh, dominant phase. Um, an interesting question is what this talk is about: is uh, scaling variance. This morning we have seen many examples of um, power law behavior, and here we will continue to see more and. And the reason is the following. A scaling variance is related with uh, what is called critical behavior that appears uh, when the correlation length is infinite. In that case, the exponential correlation function is no longer valid. There is a singularity. And actually, the correlation function becomes uh, algebraic with some exponent. This exponent measures the correlation um, instead of the correlation length, because the correlation length is, uh, in this case, infinite. And it's a critical exponent. We'll come back, late, we'll come, come back later to this point, what the critical exponent uh, is, um, what, what, what is the importance of the critical exponent. But for the time being, the, in the Fourier space, instead, uh, the picture of the spectrum would be quite different from, from the finite uh, correlation length, where we have a uh, power law decay over most of the range of, of our uh, wavelength. Um, so this is the, the typical fingerprint of a critical behavior. Another, again, the same example. This is what occurs, uh, what happens in the Ising ferromagnet at, at uh, the Cody temperature, where we have um, uh, both phases percolating one on into the other with uh, a typical typical size that is diverging with the system size. Um, Critical behavior is typically connected with uh, fractal uh, objects. This morning we have seen a little bit about how to compute fractal dimensions, and here um, I will just mention that fractals are uh, statistically invariant objects, uh, so that we can uh, we can uh, if we if we rescale or or phi or 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 state variable by b to uh, alpha and then our space variable by b this is after this uh, change of scale we recover a field that has the same statistical properties as, as the original field this uh, alpha is uh, directly related to the fractal dimension of the of the object and so it's a very important quantity and this is just a um, graphic um, representation of what this transformation means Basic, basically if i have my for instance, in the case of uh, the instinct, the contour of these uh, of these uh, clusters. If I have my my object, in this case, is a line, and then I I take a small part and then apply this transformation. So I I rescale or I zoom in, I zoom in um, with an anisotropic um, box this uh, a small part of the system. I have some surface or some meat, some line here that has the same distribution, the same statistical properties, moments, etc., as the original one. And then it can, and in principle, this can go uh, forever. 
of course in nature we have um, boundaries and we have um, cutoffs uh, both uh, above and below and I'm sure when you measure refractive emission this afternoon uh, you will see how your system size affects your the size of your systems affects these bounds uh, of, of the scaling behavior. But now the question I would like to ask is uh, how um, <coughs> this um, scaling behavior, this uh, scale invariant um, behavior can occur in nature. In the case of um, equilibrium systems, actually uh, to get to the critical point, to the point where things are scale invariant, requires a fine tuning of, of the model parameters. In um, somehow abstract view, one can think of a Hamiltonian of some state variable, and then k is the vector k is the, the complete set of constants of my system, temperature, pressure, uh, magnetization, etc. All the coupling constants between the terms of my Hamiltonian, and then I can, I, the critical behavior is equivalent to finding a, I mean, a, the, this, I apply the scale transformation, as I said before, I call this a generic e R of P, and I apply this to the Hamiltonian, and then when I apply this transformation, in general, I will obtain a, a different Hamiltonian with a different set of parameters. Uh, some terms will, uh, will appear, will be, some new terms could appear, and the Hamiltonian could be actually very different from the original one. The question is that the critical point, uh, um, at the critical point, uh, the physics, that's the Hamiltonian, is independent of the, of the observation scale. So actually, the critical point corresponds to a fixed point of this transformation. Um, so um, all the physics and mathematics related with phase transitions in equilibrium systems consist of finding this uh, critical point and, and studying this uh, transformation and finding the, this uh, fixed point of the transformation. Uh, this is a very nice picture because also the, the phases, this, um, um, it's called the romanization group and it's, very, it's a very nice picture because it also explains universality in the sense that I can come from different um, Hamiltonians in different places and, the, and applying this um, um, scale transformation I can end up at a fixed point coming from different places that is attracting many Hamiltonians to the same fixed point and this um, a sketch <coughs> more or less um, allows uh, to understand the origin of universality that is that different systems with different in principle interactions of different nature mechanical or magnetic or whatever can produce the same kind of critical behavior when they are tuned to their respective uh, critical points and universality refers to the fact that critical exponents are independent of microscopic details and only symmetries conservation laws and the dimension of the other parameter determine the universality class I guess um, this is a well-known fact. I would like now to talk about uh, how uh, scale invariance appears in non-equilibrium systems. And the question is important because there are many examples in nature of, um, of uh, scale invariance and uh, one cannot think that uh, nature turns uh, uh, does some fine tuning of some magic external parameters so in order to obtain uh, fractal dimension at all scales from nanoscopic this is a thin film uh, actually it's a simulation of, of a thin of a film uh, nano deposit of particles this is um, romesco and this is uh, a coast so uh, at a very different scale we find um, the scale invariance so we need some kind of uh, paradigm to understand how this uh, can come about. Uh, another example of uh, another property of nature is universality. And this is, a, to me, a very nice example, a very rigorous one as well. Here you have a um, deposit of, this is an experiment, of um, a deposit of gold on silica, I think. And these are ripples that are formed 
by our physical process and interactions that occur on nanoscale, and this is sun in the beach. And actually, the models that describe sun, the, the, how dunes and these ripples are formed uh, due to the effect of water on sun, is, uh, is the models are actually, uh, I would say, identical in an abstract sense to the models that describe this sort of process. So this is a universality, and then so comes about independent of uh, tuning parameters. Uh, there's also many examples of uh, one over Earth of fractal in time. I, I've been speaking about fractal in in space, but there are also many examples of fractal in time. What is called generic as, as the problem of one over F noise, and we have uh, examples from the from the from music from from the rumor of uh, in the fluctuations of the sound in, of uh, water running or the of the pulse the, the emission in pulse in pulses there are examples in astrophysics in, in electronics etc and I mean there's uh, many examples of, of um, scale invariance in in, in in time as well so the question is um, well, how, how easy is it to find generic uh, scale invariance in, in outer equilibrium? And what is the difference with equilibrium? Uh, because one should not expect to, um, to have to tune, uh, or not, uh, the systems are not expected to tune themselves to, to the coupling constant that exactly give the critical decay. Um, so I would like to discuss here a certain genetic mechanism to produce. Uh, um, Long range for um, scaling behavior in, in non equilibrium systems. And this is uh, just one of the flavors of complexity, which is one of the uh, subjects of, of the school. Uh, I would like first to show you that equilibrium systems are quite genetically uh, unable to produce, in a generic way, uh, uh, scaling variance. And the reason is the Boltzmann distribution. This is the the expected distribution of my of my variables in my system at equilibrium. Is this Boltzmann distribution with the Hamiltonian and temperature? The question is that one can actually compute from this uh, distribution at equilibrium, uh, stationary state. One can, can compute the correction function exactly. For that, well, actually, one only needs some. Um, a generic Hamiltonian with as many terms as you wish, uh, coupling, diffusive coupling, uh, potential of several orders, etc. One can think of all the terms as you wish here, because the most relevant term is the first two. And when you, you can compute actually in exact way the correction function from the Boltzmann distribution, you find that this, is, this correction function is going to be some algebraic um, um, prefactor and then what is dominating the correction function is the exponential. This uh, correction length uh, diverges with r when, when r goes to zero. So this uh, scales with r in a certain way. These results are actually randomization group results, and it's actually it's, um, independent of of if one whether one includes uh, high order corrections, nonlinearities, etc. So this is a genetic result in um, equilibrium in equilibrium. So equilibrium systems are generically uh, unable to produce uh, scale invariance unless one tunes the parameters of the Hamiltonian to some values such that this correction function diverges. For instance, in this case, uh, it's the typical example, it is a mean field approximation, and when R goes to zero, this correction length diverges, and this, uh, this correction length diverges, and then this correction function as a singularity. And that's uh, actually a phase transition. In, uh, well, actually, that's what is explained here. So the only way to obtain, well, one of the ways to obtain in equilibrium uh, critical behavior is to tune, in this case, R, but in general, certain parameters such that the certain terms are zero, and then the correction then diverges. So there is an equivalence in equilibrium between scale invariance and critical points. 
And now I would like to discuss the case of non-equilibrium systems. Well, non-equilibrium systems are dynamical systems, open systems that are described in a similar way, but the difference is that the, so we have the field derivative um, in time. This is the the part where all the dynamics is included, or, or symmetries, or interactions, or transport, and then we have uh, noise. Uh, the noise actually usually is uh, taken to be delta correlated, that's not very important here. The question is that this function, the function that includes all the um, all the physics of the problem, uh, is not potential. So we cannot derive a Hamiltonian function, that we cannot derive or, or deterministic part from a Hamiltonian function. And this is a crucial point, because it means uh, that many terms that in Hamiltonian systems are forbidden because they're, they're, these are not Hamiltonian terms, in this case are, are allowed. So if we want to, in the same spirit as before, um, span or, 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 or dynamics uh, given by F in, uh, as a power expansion, we will have many terms. Some of them are Hamiltonian, are the same terms that we can f could find in equilibrium systems, like these uh, blue ones that are uh, potential um, local terms, and then the interaction diffusion terms, and then this uh, all the series of powers uh, of the gradient, which are not uh, um, Hamiltonian, are not potential. They cannot be obtained from from the derivation of a, of a function. Then the only, the only way to obtain genetic scale invariance in this kind of system, where all these terms are present, uh, well, is uh, to require an extra symmetry. Uh, so it's uh, to require that the system is invariant under, under this transformation. Uh, if we, uh, of course, I say here the only way is uh, actually wrong because uh, we can have this same function, and then we can tune several parameters to zero. But what I wanted to say is that this is a um, very generic way to produce a scale invariance out of equilibrium. Um, if we um, <coughs> if we require this symmetry to to, ex to 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 be valid, then many of these terms, um, for instance, all these terms, are not allowed in our, in our description, and at the lowest order. Well, See. At the lowest order, we get to this equation, which is just simply, let me show you, if we allow this, uh, if we apply this symmetry and require the system to be invariant under this symmetry, all these terms are cancelled. Many of these nonlinear terms are also cancelled, and at the lowest order, we arrive to this, um, to this equation. This is the carter paris equation that describes many, describes many systems. Um, but actually was initially proposed to describe uh, nonlinear surface growth. The basic, the essential term is this, this nonlinearity, which is, uh, it translates into, uh, converts the, the, makes the problem non-Hamiltonian. The question now is, uh, well, I would like to just to go back to here. Uh, you can ask, well, I can do the same in equilibrium systems, I can, I can require my Hamiltonian to fulfill uh, this invariance, and then I should have uh, a scale invariance as well, because actually the, the, the kind of terms are the same. So I, I'm canceling all these terms in the equilibrium system. I could produce also, and that's true. But the big difference is that the, if you do this, um, because we are in equilibrium, we have a Hamiltonian system, uh, a continuous symmetry implies a conserved quantity. So, in, uh, if we require a Hamiltonian system to have this, uh, to satisfy this uh, invariance, this transformation, invariance under this, transform, under this, this translation, that's, uh, that implies uh, immediately that the, um, there is a conserved quantity, which is the, the field. And this is a big restriction. A, big, a very strong conservation law on the system. So there are many, few, uh, just a few systems that verify this uh, conservation law. Examples are domain walls in inframagnets, as I 
one of the examples I showed uh, at the beginning, or the, the typical uh, problem of the two, two phases in equilibrium. But there are very few systems because this is a very strong requirement and implies uh, very particular dynamics on the system. The difference in non-equilibrium is that uh, we can have uh, this uh, work symmetry fulfilled and we don't have any extra conservation law in the system and the system is free to have many of these terms and all the gradient terms actually and then the richness of the physics is uh, much much uh, wider. Uh, well, the question is that KPZ is one of the most uh, difficult equations if you read. Maybe this is a nice exaggeration, but if you think that this equation was proposed in 1986 and the, so the, so the solution is not known, uh, has been unknown for almost 30 years, there are some exact solutions to for, for some boundary conditions that have been proposed in the last uh, few years and that's uh, something that have, has uh, reactivated the research on this, uh, on this problem. Not only because this equation is uh, difficult to solve and uh, I mean, almost uh, anyone would like to be able to solve it and make himself very famous. Uh, the question is that this equation is very important for, for physics of non-equilibrium systems and that's the last part of my of my talk how KPZ relates to many problems and why is that important to solve it uh, so this is the last part which is the Carter Price Sun paradigm uh, just in case you don't just to introduce a little bit what is the physics behind KPZ KPZ has uh, two terms basically uh, well, apart from the noise, one term is just diffusion, so the, the, the interface of the field tends to relax uh, its value to the nearest neighbors in a symmetric way. And then there is this term, this nonlinear term, that is the important term, that the, the characteristic APC term that makes the problem so difficult and makes the problem uh, non potential, non Hamiltonian. This term is the lowest order nonlinearity that one can think of in, in an interface problem. Uh, and it's related with what is called um, lateral law. And the, the idea is that one can project, I mean, one can, if phi grows in the vertical direction, one can project uh, the gradient of the surface, the curvature of the surface. Um, projected uh, towards the vertical direction uh, in this way and one can compute exactly given a, a velocity of, of um, in, in the normal direction and one can uh, actually find that uh, the because of the curvature the KPC nonlinearity comes very naturally as uh, the, f the first uh, order correction to the normal velocity in the vertical direction so that means that this term is a uh, very basic nonlinearity that will appear in almost any uh, system that is out of equilibrium. Um, um, well, as, as I said before, uh, this problem, the way we have constructed this scale invariance, that means that we can transform the space, time, and the field uh, in a through some um, uh, critical exponents and we'll find that the space and time correlation function scales um, like in critical systems in typical equi equilibrium critical systems with uh, some uh, critical exponents the exponent set is related with the, um, uh, how the correlations how fast the correlation is spread in, in time so, so this describes how the correlation length is becoming, well, this, this should be t, how the correlation length uh, becomes infinite in time as time goes by. And then again, oops, again the roughness exponents, and it says it before, is related with the fractal dimension. Um, 
for instance, results that are known about uh, KPZ is that in 1D, uh, as I said also before, uh, one can compute these exponents uh, uh, exactly, and there is no need of uh, randomization group or anything sophisticated, it's just uh, symmetry arguments that give you these uh, two exponents. However, uh, no matter how easy it is to compute these exponents in 1D, uh, there is no result for D larger than 1. Even if we have some um, analytical, uh, some solutions in 1D, some estimates of how things could be in higher dimensions, the problem is virtually and practically unsolved in dimensions larger than 1. So in, in any real practical dimension that we can think of. Uh, we only have numerical estimates. There are some uh, scaling arguments um, that differ on how what the exponents uh, are in higher dimensions, and even numerical simulations are very hard about a system dimension. Even the issue whether there is a crit uh, critical dimension, meaning uh, whether there is a dimension above which the system becomes as if it were mean field, uh, is uh, still unsolved. And well, there are many issues related to KPZ. Uh, well, the source of the promise, as I said before, is the nature of the nonlinear term. And RG calculations are fail in this problem because the, the interesting physics is occurring when the uh, nonlinearity diverges. So there is no perturbative approach that will work here. As I said before, I, I don't have reference you know, or anything, but uh, there are recent work which uh, well, somehow opens certain parts to investigate this, but still the problem is largely, largely unsolved. Um, so the basic the ingredients uh, to obtain generic, the basic or the the most uh, most elemental, um, simplistic, uh, generic um, scale invariants with no tuning parameters, uh, non-equilibrium is the KPZ universality. And the basic ingredients are diffusion, uh, thermal noise, that means uh, actually uncorrelated noise, um, some kind of dissipative nonlinear couplings. And I, says, I said, I say, I say, just some sort of dissipative nonlinear couplings because actually one does not need to uh, to to um, to feed in the KPZ nonlinearity. The KPZ nonlinearity, when we have nonlinear couplings are dissipative, will uh, appear in a natural way. Without we don't need to include it actually. It will just turn out to be the relevant term. And then one fourth condition is that the symmetry uh, phi minus phi that is that uh, or field up above the mean and below the mean is different it has different statistics this produces KTZ scale these conditions are believe me that these conditions are uh, very general and you would be amazed, uh, amazed the amount of systems and, and problems that have this uh, actually satisfy these conditions. Just to show you an example of some of these systems that uh, chemical vapor deposition, electrochemical deposition, and in this context, they are uh, in this context, KPZ is relevant. Molecular epitaxy, not exactly to describe molecular epitaxy, don't get me wrong. Is uh, in certain limits and certain conditions of uh, molecular epitaxy, and you you get KPZ. To describe uh, high pressure uh, indivision, fluid indivision in porous, me in porous uh, disordered media, bacterial bacterial colonies, uh, fire front, for instance. There are many nice uh, some nice experiments on, on fire fronts in, in the combustion of paper. This is also KPZ. Fracture. And this is also very nice. If you take a piece of paper, well, you take a, take a piece of paper, you break it, you just tear it. Well, the scaling of the of the line that you get when you tear it and you don't cheat, you get um, a surface which has the exponent of 
KPZ, and if you describe how it escapes with system size and how and the models describe how the, uh, this um, uh, line evolves in two dimensions, and that's when you have, instead of a line, a, a piece of paper, you have a block, like this, of a rock, for instance, or wood, and you put a notch here, and then spread apart, like tearing paper, but in, two dimen in three dimensions. The line that you get also, has, uh, when you do these uh, high velocities, uh, high, uh, high pressure, you get KPZ as well, but in, in 2D, 2D surfaces. So it's um, fracture, so KPZ is very important in fracture. For instance, KPZ has a direct relation with the problem, very important problem of the minimum energy surface in the solar media. KPZ is directly connected with this problem and also with random directed polymers. I will show, I think I have a, uh, oh, so yeah, I have. It's also directly related with random directed polymers. Random directed polymers are, mm, uh, um, well, I have a, a slide after that. Uh, these two are very important problems in disorder and media and has been have been very important for many years, related with localization of particles, polymers, uh, big matter molecules, etc. So these two problems are, th this actually is a very important problem in physics and mathematics. Well, the minimum energy surf, uh, land, uh, surface or line in a disorder media is where you, I have a disorder media in any dimension and I ask how can go this disorder media has uh, mm, I have to go from one side to the from one side to the other side of my system, and every step I give, I I, I do, uh, costs me energy. Then I have to calculate this energy is random because the, my media is disordered, so I don't know a priori which is the best uh, walk I, or path I have to to take, and then I have to compute the. I want to choose the minimum. Path that is the the path that cost me the less energy you know, in, in my system. The solution to this is KPZ as well related. This is very closely related with random polymers, as I said. Uh, this is also I don't know if Antonio is going to talk anything about this, but this KPZ is very um, much related with uh, actually it describes the dynamics of of the Lyapunov vector in space-time chaos. Uh, random matrix theory. Actually, many of the, well, some of the recent exact solutions of or, or analytical solutions of KPZ are related, are results uh, coming from random matrix theory. So it's not a, a, actually KPZ, but some results in random matrix theory that can be applied to KPZ. And localization random media and turbulence. And there are many more examples. So that's the reason why KPZ has become such a, an important subject. Let me just um, have a few five minutes or so. Let me just explain how these interconnections um, in some examples are produced, and just to show you that it's not just that KPZ is uh, appears uh, everywhere. Just, uh, you need to to see the problems in a certain way such that you can get the connection to KPZ. Just as, as an example, I will talk here about. Um, um, a couple of problems. I have KPZ. Suppose I do this uh, transformation. I define a new variable, double B, which is the exponential of my, basically, the exponential of my field phi. I just put here lambda nu just to avoid, just to, to use uh, natural uh, units. If I do this transformation, I get to this equation. This equation has been very important in uh, in the problem of localization of particles in random potentials. Uh, so one can actually realize that if I can say anything about this, I can obtain solutions uh, or scaling behavior or analytical solutions of, of KPZ. I will also solve this problem, which has also been a long-standing problem in disorder systems. Uh, this equation actually also describes uh, the dynamics of the Lyapunov vector, or the infinitum, 
to be more spe much more precise, the infinite infinitesimal perturbation in space time k. I can show a little bit uh, just uh, to show you how this comes about. Suppose I have well, of course, I'm going to take the most simple and, and for the sake of the argument, and so it can be shown very simply. Suppose I have a reaction diffusion system like this. So this is my, I have a special, uh, U is uh, my variable, concentration for instance of particles, and then it follows um, reaction, a diffusion and reaction equation. This is a highly nonlinear function, and this describes many systems in, in, in chemical systems, for instance. So there are many examples of, of, of uh, models that follow this uh, generic dynamics. If I compute, uh, I just seen this morning, I do a perturbation of you, and I ask about uh, how um, um, this perturbation propagates in time. This is the what is called the Lyapunov uh, vector. It's related with the Lyapunov exponent, of course. And if I do the calculation, I get uh, this um, f, f prime u, and then f u. Uh, And then I can define my field, as I did before, uh, logarithm of uh, delta u, and I will get for phi the KPZ equation. So this is um, another connection uh, with um, KPZ. So if we can solve KPZ, we can solve a lot of uh, problems related with the space-time chaos as well. Uh, actually, this, uh, if we see this uh, W as a, as a probability, uh, the solution of this equation is the partition function of a random directed polymer of length t and temperature uh, t, where t is related with the, with the constants of, uh, of KPZ. In a random medium with uh, this order, is, uh, this uh, eta, with uh, one free end. That means I take uh, one free end, I just write all the, all the paths that go from here to, to a line here, and this, uh, part the partition function, all of these polymers that crosses the system in this way, uh, obey KPZ. The interesting question, for instance, is that the free energy of these uh, paths is uh, actually my field. So if I find the scaling behavior of my field, I solve the the equilibrium, the, the equilibrium actually, the equilibrium problem of the uh, random directed polymers. Uh, well, just I think I'll finish here just to show you this transparency that a little bit uh, messy, but tries to just to show you the connection of KPZ uh, universality, uh, which is the, as I said, the minimal example of the scale invariant behavior in non-equilibrium and how it is connected with so many problems. Some of them are direct, the, the turbulence, surface flow, perturbation dynamics in space-time chaos, and localization of directed polymers. Some other are inferred, random matrices, optimal path, directed polymers, etc. So, um, so that's um, all I wanted to say, just to um, the question how important is the, the just to uh, symmetry in the problem just by uh, asking my system to satisfy uh, asymmetry um, produces uh, uh, an equation that is uh, a scaling variant produces a scale invariant solution that is uh, relevant in many fields in non-equilibrium physics. And <coughs> that's all I wanted to, to say. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. So, questions? I have one a kind of uh, a conceptual remark or something like that. You were saying, I mean, at some point, you were saying equilibrium, they have Hamiltonian. Non equilibrium, then I cannot derive uh, any longer from a variation of principle. Well, in non equilibrium, there is a class of systems that are so called gradient systems that can, that can be derived also from a variation of principle. So it's <coughs> equilibrium, then, uh, as I see it, uh, this intermediate class of gradient systems, and then the full non equilibrium system, uh, as the KPZ. Mm -hmm. Just. Mm. Do you mean <coughs> that you, you have some generalized potential, mm -hmm. but it's not conserved, or so it doesn't satisfy the conditions to be a Hamiltonian? So you don't have. Uh, Mm. Because here is very important condition of Hamiltonian because, as I said, if this is another theorem. If you have a, just, I mean, relevant to what I wanted to say, it's true that there are systems that can be, here I have been always uh, mixing two concepts. So that's what you wanted to say, two concepts. One is Hamiltonian, and the, the existence of a Hamiltonian function, and another question is the existence of a potential function generalized potential such that my dynamics can be derived in a gradient way so that my dynamics as I've been calling F can be or not derived from some uh, functional derivative of some potential mm -hmm. All right and the question okay the thing is very different I mean the, the problem uh, this is true but this is for me an unequilibrium system as well mm -hmm. in the sense I'm speaking here because even if you, I'm, I'm not, I have not been very clear, but I didn't expect uh, people to know uh, so much about this. The question is that uh, this, if this function is not, uh, has not the property of a Hamiltonian, I cannot apply the second part of the argument. Is in Hamiltonian systems, uh, invariance under some kind of asymmetry uh, leads to a conservation law. That's another system. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Hamiltonian systems, I can say that if I have this um, invariance, I will have some conservation law. In actually, the conservation <coughs> law is the integral of my field. This is constant in time. But this is only because my system is uh, Hamiltonian. So this is another theory. Yes, another theory. and that applies when you have not only potential, uh, generalized potentials, etc. You have to have Hamiltonian dynamics, Hamiltonian structure of your system, and Hamiltonian conservation of the energy. And this can, these are the requirements. So, in the sense I was speaking in this talk, systems like this, even if I just use this uh, very loosely, uh, are not Hamiltonian. Are not, uh, so, this would be non equilibrium, and everything I said about this will apply. So, it's not just potential, but Hamiltonian. Other question? When you transform the KPZ equation to the one with the W, um, is it the same for either It's the Hamilton interpretation or? No. Uh, Some drift correction needed? Um, uh, there is no problem with that because. You mean this, this to get yes, this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, from from this, I don't think there is any problem because uh, it's just a continuous transformation. You don't add new derivatives or anything. You mean how do you well? Actually, you derive uh, uh, with the normal r um, rules of Cartan. So, so yes, so it's just Cartan rules. Yes. So it's actually, it's true that you are right that when you do this transformation, you have to compute some derivatives here, uh, this key, and then you have to give in give a meaning to that. It's just a uh, normal calculus in, the, in this case. Is it by a physicist? Sorry? <laughs> is it by a physicist? Is it written by a mathematician? It's written by a mathematician, maybe nothing will work. Yeah, but then, then if, if you do it, you have an additional term. Yes. One half of W, yes. you have to do it. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't think that changed much the physics. Because actually all these problems are, I don't know, yeah, I, I mean, I'm just guessing it would not. I'm not saying it, it doesn't. But my only argument is that um, in the spirit uh, these equations are written. Actually, it, it doesn't matter how many terms you include here. Well, the main physics is included in the, in the most relevant ones. In the, so maybe it's not, it's not even important, sure. but I don't know. Sure. Any further questions? Oh, I have a question. So we have sh you have shown us a transparency of all the systems to which the KPZ can be applied. The last transparency. Yes, sure. Yeah. Now let's assume that there is a system which is not here. Probably. What? There is a system which no, is not here. No, of course there are. Yes. Okay. yes. Now my question is, the, the, they are there, they are not there because they do not have a conserved quantity like that. Or because you have, even if you have the concept no. quantity, you have to do higher order terms in the in the question. Well, that's a very good question. Yes, as I said, this is the simplest and most basic uh, system that satisfies the scaling invariance, generic in mm -hmm. the sense that you have, have to tune out of equilibrium. But it's true that apart from this condition, you can require other conditions. Mm -hmm. So when you have uh, this kind of uh, say Taylor expansion or however you call it like this uh, this uh, requirement re removes I mean cancels all these terms but many of these terms are there the most relevant one is this and the diffusion term but you can have a system where the, you don't have diffusion of, of your field you this uh, you can have an argument such that this uh, argument this uh, term cannot be present either well, then you have to so you have to go to higher order. and that gives you different universalities of course yeah. And the same, of course, for this. You can have a system that is actually, as I said here, if uh, a condition uh, is this one. Well, suppose this symmetry is not broken. You have a system that is actually invariant um, below and above the average. Then, if this symmetry is not, bro is, uh, is not broken, it's actually a symmetry of your system, then the KPC term cannot uh, exist. Mm -hmm. And you go to the next term in the expansion. So, but this system, those systems are more complicated, uh, are, are not the simplest case of scaling value. But actually, you are true. You are, you are right. You can, you can have systems, actually, you have systems where there is no diffusion. You have to go to the next linear term. And you don't have KP set because uh, the symmetry is not broken. And so, this, for instance, uh, has this uh, symmetry broken as well, but this one, no. So, this is the next in your series, and like that. And this actually, uh, this, uh, this term, fourth derivative of the field. As this, and this one is, a, is the, you know, that's important in molecular epitaxy. Huh? That's the model that describes the ideal molecular epitaxy. Thank you. So, if there are no further questions, we thank you for <laughs> And now, we have the final session. Uh, on the lecture by